This book is a continual description of our relationship with the Lord and how we're searching for him. And sometimes we don't find him. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we speak with him. Sometimes he speaks to us. Um, so there's a continuous struggle in, in our spiritual life. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, and actually, if, if you'll see, almost every chapter has this uh, theme. But <clears throat> um, as we mentioned before, um, there's eight chapters, and they could be further divided into three main parts, which actually applies more to the early rituals that the Jews had um, in terms of marriage. So there are three main steps, kind of like there are today, but sometimes they're called different things. So, so there's the courtship, or what they used to call engagement, which is kind of similar to proposal and courtship, where you make plans, and it starts becoming public when, you, when the two are planning to be wed, right? And then there is more of a formal commitment. Um, and sometimes it's called betrothal, sometimes it's called engagement. And just as an example, this is when the Holy Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, they were betrothed. So at this point, though, um, it was considered the legal marriage, but they don't live together. The marriage is not consummated. Um, but nevertheless, you can even call, um, like St. Mary sometimes was called the wife of Joseph, for example. Okay, so this is the legal aspect of, of marriage. Um, and then finally is, is the full um, union um, where they live together and, and serve together. <clears throat> okay, so this chapter is more related to the second step, the betrothal. Um, she's looking for him still. She's still um, in search. Um, and as the fathers say, this is kind of like the day of our baptism, um, because when we are baptized in Christ, we have put on Christ, as St. Paul says. And we've become, we start to become one with the Lord, um, officially. We're baptized in his name, but we're not necessarily there yet. We're not living with him forever in his home, um, even though we hope to. Okay, so um, I kind of also titled this earlier, this talk, uh, Striking Out in Our Search um, for the Lord. So we'll use kind of like a baseball analogy. I don't really like baseball, but I just thought it was appropriate. <laughs> um, because in this chapter, we see her trying three times and failing. Okay, But she succeeds at the end. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Okay, so here... Um, she starts by saying, by night on my bed, I sought the one I loved. I sought him, but I could not find him. So she strikes out because, first of all, she's looking at the wrong time and in the wrong way. Okay? Um, if you remember in chapter one, she does not search at night. She, search, she searches when? At the noontime. Um, and we said here the symbolism is because the heat uh, of the sun has burnt us or the sin has affected us. So that's why we can't find him, right? And we need his shade, his shadow. Now she's seeking him at night. <clears throat> so which one is it, you, you'll say? Is it at noon or at night, right? Well, I, I'll say both. How is that possible? Um, well, when was it dark at noontime? In the crucifixion, right? So. Here's the symbolism where we're, it's, it's noontime, the heat is bothering us, but also we're in darkness, our eyes in darkness. Or as, as the Lord said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Um, and Gregory the Great says, though our hearts are already watchful for him, our eyes are still blind or darkened. Right? <clears throat> so this is why she's searching for him at night. But even worse than that, she's searching for him in bed. Um, of course, that doesn't make anyone any sense, right? And St. Ambrose says, let no one who seeks carefully seek while in bed. Um, so as uh, some of the fathers say, this shows that even though we're weak, even though we're still filled of darkness um, or our thoughts are filled with darkness or when we're unable to get out of our bed of sin, we still desire him. 
which is good. Um, and But we're in the wrong place and at the wrong time. Uh, but this is not the end of the story, right? <clears throat> so His Holiness Pope Shenouda of Blessed Memory has actually um, most of the lectures in, in, in his um, series uh, that he gave in the early 70s um, were about the, the few, first few verses of, the, of this chapter. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, he says, um, this remind, he, he's, he's kind of speaking of the person who loved God and started walking, but kind of slipped. Um, and so he says, in the past you were blazing fire, but now you can't find it. No fervency in prayer, no emotions, no comfort, no feelings. You seek God, but do not find him. All of us at one point or another, we experience this. It's a, and then he continues by saying, it may be because now you're in bed after a long day of work. Maybe you are so deeply involved in work that your spiritual feelings have withered. Probably you didn't invite God in your work all day long and became estranged from him. When you sought him by night, you didn't find him. Um, and then he continues to say, uh, when you were familiar with God, he was closer to you than the air you, you breathe, you inhale. But now when you call him, it seems as if you are speaking to yourself. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we feel this in prayer, but it's okay. Um, as we'll see, he says, in the past, when you read the Holy Scriptures, you found many meditations which filled your heart and mind, granting overwhelming comfort. Now you find nothing, only repeating the words, I sought him, but I didn't find him. <clears throat> and uh, Pope Shunuda always used to say, um, in, in reference to uh, God telling the Israelites in the Old Testament, there's going to be days and there's going to be nights. There's going to be winter and there's going to be summer. There's going to be um, cold, and there's going to be fervency. So it's okay. It's okay that some days we're in the dark. But the question is, do we examine ourselves and say, I did not find him, but I will seek him. Um, nevertheless, I'm still going to get up out of my bed and, and look and, and, and try to bring that fervency back in my heart. Um, he says, I do not feel him in my life, but he is in my heart. Um, I feel his presence in my intentions and desires. Um, so sometimes when we're deprived of him, it makes us search for him more. Um, to say, where, where am I now compared to where I was before? Um, that should encourage me to, I'm not pleased with the state. I need, I need to do something. Of course, it's God's grace, but uh, Pope Shunura always says, also says, we don't... Um, overly depend on his grace to the point where we're just going to say, stay in bed and say, okay, God, like your grace needs to come and, and pick me up. You know, we have to, we have to do something, right? Even though we're still in the middle of it. Um, and we use the example of Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus looked, he went up the tree looking for the Lord, but had he left his, his job yet? Have, had he given to the poor yet? He made that decision only after, he saw the Lord and spoke with him and heard the voice that said, today I will stay at your house. Um, <clears throat> so so it's okay to have the desire, but not fulfill it yet. We just need to stir up that desire more and more so that it leads us to searching even more. Um, and that's what the second attempt is. So she struck out the first time. And she also struck out the second time. But what is the difference? She said, I will rise now. And I'm going to go about, I'm not going to stay in my house. I'm not going to stay in my bed. I'm going to go around the city and in the streets and in the squares, and I will search. Um, <clears throat> so this is the internal longing for God. Say, okay, my first attempt failed. Um, but now in my second attempt, I will rise. She still doesn't find him yet. Um, but kind of like what we're saying, sometimes we get used to him to come to us. We're we get kind of spoiled as children of God um, before the trials and the tribulations. And oftentimes we say in the spiritual life, the beginning is the easy part because God wants us to continue. So he makes it easy. And then when we continue, what happens? The, the tough times come, the tribulations come, the tests come. Um, that's not when we give up or say, oh, I did something wrong. We're always doing something wrong, but we just need to continue. And his holiness continues and says, Oh, Lord, there are obstacles that prevent me from coming closer to you, but you, O oh Lord, know that I love you. So the question is, do we still love him? <clears throat> uh, 
uh, it is true that I am asleep, but I love you. And we'll see this in a couple of chapters um, where she seeks for him. She says, my heart is awake. I'm asleep in my bed, but my heart is awake. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is true that I err and commit sins, yet I still love you. Even though I do not do the things that reflect this love for you, yet I truly have love for you. So sometimes we can even say this in our prayers. I, I, I fell and I did this wrong, um, but I still have a desire for you. It's not manifest in, in my current or present actions, and I wish to change that by your grace. Um, but I'm not going to give up because I do have this love. Um, and so we need to look for him as she does everywhere, even though she comes up empty the second time. Right? Um, then she gets a little smart. So, okay, I have to take a time out. Um, uh, or I need to get a consultation. I need to huddle. I need to get advice from my coach. Um, so where does she go? She went to the watchmen who go about the city. And, and actually, she didn't go, go to them. They went to her. Um, and the fathers say, there's two explanations here. The first one are like the guardian angels. And um, by the way, uh, another example, when we said the, the, the first example of at night is during the cross, right? Because it was dark at noon, right? And then they buried the Lord. And... When the women came to uh, to perform the burial spices, right, at the tomb, um, they were first met, not by the Lord, but by the guardian angels, right? <clears throat> and they said, he is not here, for he is risen. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And so the father, St. Cyril, and also St. Ambrose, say, here, these are the watchmen that were looking for him, but we, we have helpers to tell us, uh, you're, you're almost there. <laughs> um, another example or another explanation here are the servants of the church or, or the priests of the church. As Gregory the Great says, the watchmen who guard the city find us as we search. So again, the search is not just by ourselves. We just need the intention and the desire to look and, and we'll find. We'll go to the church and you, you'll find uh, he will give you an answer. <clears throat> he says, because the Holy Fathers who guard the church's orthodoxy come to meet our good efforts to teach us by the words of their writings. Um, so next time, um, or the night time is also an opportunity to search in our inner self, to find solace with God in the calmness of the night. So another example of the night is, it's a time when where there's quiet. We're not, it's not the hustle and bustle of the world, so we have an opportunity to repent. Um, and we say, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Um, so this is a good opportunity to reassess our, our relation with God and our search. And even the, the failures that we had in the past, how, how can we correct? <clears throat> Have you seen the one I love? Um, and again, His Holiness writes, <laughs> um, love is forever in her heart. Love for the Lord is the foundation of this relationship. It's not founded on formalities, false pretenses, mere rituals, commandments, or fear. Rather, it is based on love. Of course, all those other things are important, but if there's no love, then it's nothing. It's like a clanking symbol, like St. Paul says. Um, <clears throat> you will delight in the Lord. You will find joy in the cross. This is the hard part. <laughs> um, because from outside, the cross does not is not appealing. But for the Christian who... who, who takes at the cross even out of obedience in the beginning, there is a joy that is found in, in the middle of it, as we'll see in, in a few verses. <clears throat> but His Holiness continues, you'll find joy in the cross and you'll rejoice in the thorns and in the nails. You'll experience happiness in trials, in difficulties and in hardships. You'll experience firsthand that the life with the Lord is happiness itself, whether or not there is a cross. And usually, almost always, there is a cross. But nevertheless, there is joy. He says, it will always be the source of eternal, never-ending joy. Uh, as St. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always again. I will say rejoice. So um, this, this encourages us not to run away from trials and tribulations, but to see the joy that is hidden in them. Um, after all of these failures and all of these um, four 
uh, or poorly organized searches. Finally, the Lord comes to her. Um, as she, she says, I just finished talking to them, asking, and all of a sudden, scarcely had I passed them by when I found the one I love. Um, actually, he found her. Uh, I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother, this is the church, and into the chamber. Actually, he brings us <laughs> to, to, to the church, not vice versa. And into the chamber of her who conceived me. Um, <clears throat> so here we find uh, the journey from Gethsemane, which is the cross, to Tabor, which is the revelation or the transfiguration, the Lord uh, revealing himself to us and his glory to us. Um, like what happened in the three days or so after the crucifixion, um, when he revealed himself to the apostles and to Mary Mag Saint Mary Magdalene. <clears throat> um, but at this point, he said, do not cling to me. That's a whole other uh, story. Um, but nevertheless, the fathers make this connection here with this verse. Um, and Saint Cyril says that Saint Mary Magdalene grabbed the Lord's feet and did not want to let him go. He told her, no, you need the house of your mother first. You need the church first. Go to the apostles, um, the gathering at the house of the mother, um, so I can announce the resurrection to all of you. Um, so the same idea, uh, as we'll see next week, with the Samaritan woman. She fell in love with him. She um, did not want to let him go, but nevertheless, she went to the, her brothers the, the rest of, and sisters of the rest of the church and brought them to, or brought him to the house, or vice versa, brought them to Christ. Um, so this is the missionary work that happens in, in the life of the person who is in love with the Lord. Um, we'll skip the next verse because we already spoke about it um, last time. Uh, again, there's some repeated verses here. Uh, uh, so verse 7 in chapter 2 is the same as verse uh, 5 in, in chapter 3. Um, and then here we will see a lengthy description of, um, of the Lord coming in his chariot of sorts. <laughs> um, so we're not exactly sure, uh, uh, kind of um, like we were saying last time, um, we're not always sure who's speaking, even though sometimes in our Bibles it gives a title saying the Shulamite is speaking, but some of the fathers say, no, it's, it's the groom. And sometimes it could be used interchangeably. Um, but nevertheless, it says, who, who is this coming out of the wilderness like tillers of smoke? Um, most likely it's neither the bride nor the groom um, who is saying this. Why? Because they just met. And in the, in the next verse, um, or two verses later, um, someone is coming from afar. Um, like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powers. Of course, there's a lot of symbolism here. Uh, we don't have time to go into all of it, but like we said, the wilderness in the past is the temptation, the Israelites, the lack of rest, the lack of comfort or satisfaction from God, um, and the lack of salvation because he thirsts for our salvation in the cross. Um, but notice here we see pillars of smoke, Right and and frankincense as well. Um, in the church rites, we have a lot of incense, right? And um, the church gives three or four main examples or symbols of the incense. Anyone know? What does the incense symbolize? The prayers of the saints. That's that's one. Uh, as you see at the bottom here, Revelation 8 and also Revelation 5, um, where we see the angel raising incense and St. John explains, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, So that's why we have, when, when we have prayers, certain prayers or litanies, we have the censer. Also here, um, it's the the presence of the glory or the power of God. So when God is present, we have, we see incense. Um, in Revelation and also though in, in Genesis um, and Exodus. So in Revelation it says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple. 
You see it in Revelation 15. You also see it in Genesis 15. Um, and we also, even when God appeared to Moses in Mount Sinai, the, the, the mountain smoked and the people saw and were afraid. They did not dare to approach him. Um, and also in the Mount of Transfiguration, there was a cloud. Um, so in, in the book of Isaiah, we see um, the whole house was, was filled in chapter 6. The house was filled with smoke. And then the, the seraphim brought a coal from the altar and touched his mouth with it and said, your sin is taken away or it's purged. Right? So here it's not only the presence, but also the sanctification that happens um, with, when coming in contact with God. The last example is the sacrifice. Um, as actually the priest says this prayer silently um, in the beginning of the Vespers raising of incense, um, as the deacons are doing the um, verses of the symbols, um, he recites part of Psalm 140 where he says, let my prayer before, be before you as incense, the lifting up my hands, like Christ lifted up his hands on the cross, as the evening sacrifice. Um, so we can't have sanctification, we can't have the glory of God unless there is the sacrifice of Christ. Um, and uh, th this is why we have smoke. And this is why in uh, when they see him from far away, they see pillars of smoke, just like the Israelites had uh, a pillar of smoke leading them in in um, the wilderness for the 40 years. Um, and then one of the fathers comments, well, why pillar? Because even though it's smoke, it's strong, right? Even though, like we're going to the four examples, God's glory and power, we can't see God, but he is the Almighty. Right, um, we go to God in prayer, and sometimes our Father, confession or spiritual guide will say, well, "Just pray about it." But there is power in prayer, even though there's no physical answer. Sometimes, um, uh, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross to the Jews and the Greek it looked weak, but for us it is all powerful. Um, so that's why we see smoke to man looks weak. But um, to the godly, uh, to God, it is the pillar of, of power. Okay? Um, sorry to go too much into this, um, but we're almost done. Um, then we see the perfume of myrrh and frankincense. Of course, this reminds us of the Magi who offered myrrh and frankincense. But also, as St. Cyril says, this is what was part of the mixture on the Great and Holy Friday. Um, so we see, again, the power of the sacrifice of, of Christ crucified. Um, and as St. Paul says, because we are buried with him, um, we shall also walk in new newness of life. Um, so even in this book, we'll see myrrh and, and frankincense, but especially myrrh repeated several times. Um, like, for example, when, when again she's in her bed at night, and the Lord comes, the whole door that, that he is knocking on is, is, is filled with myrrh. What is this door? What is this myrrh? It's the cross. Um, <clears throat> finally, um, I had to look this up because I didn't know what a palanquin is. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, the whoever is speaking describes saying, uh, what is this? Who is this coming from afar? First of all, it's Solomon's couch. Uh, yeah, it's, it seems strange, right? But when we explain what a palanquin is, it will make sense. With 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seed, gold, its seed of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. So the fathers say, what is the couch? It is the cross made of wood, right? Um, what are the cedars of Lebanon? These are the tallest, the strongest, the most durable, the straightest, the most orthodox, right? Um, Sweet-smelling um, uh, wood. 
that was found all over the world. Um, <clears throat> and so the fathers say this is, this is uh, a reminder of the orthodoxy, but also what Solomon himself used to build the temple that God uh, commanded. Um, and so, again, it also reminds us of the cross. Um, then we say the palanquin is actually, it's a portable throne that was carried by several men usually. Um, and it was used for two specific purposes. One was for royalty, one, one for a king or someone very honorable, kind of like a limousine. <laughs> um, they would carry on his shoulders. So here's a portable throne like the cross. Um, and the second is for a marriage. So even in Indian marriages today, celebrations, they use these very fancy um, chairs or thrones uh, and they seat the bridal couple on it. And sometimes it's just the bride and they carry them around in procession. Um, so this is why I like to think that um, most likely this is not written or set spoken by the bride because that would mean she's far from the king here. Um, I'd like to think she's inside this palanquin with him um, because another possibility explanation for this would be when she speaks about him, she calls him my beloved. But here, they're just calling him Solomon or the king, <laughs> right? She doesn't. She usually doesn't call him by this name um, because she knows him so intimately. Um, so she's also. So he is protected by his valiant men. And if we look at uh, Solomon's father, King David. Uh, it's described in the scriptures that he had 30 valiant men. Um, but here we have double that. Why? Because God's protection does not only include God, but his bride. We are protected by him, and we don't have to worry. And even if anyone tries to attack at night, they're ready. We have 60 uh, ha having their sword on their thigh, the strongest muscle in the body, um, just so that uh, if the devil wants to attack, there's no way he can attack. Um, why? Because the bride is with her groom on his throne. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, and then we don't have time to go into the, the depth of this, but usually when we see the wood, like in the temple, covered with gold from within and without, this is the symbol of God's protection, the gold from within and without of, of the wood, the, the human body. So it's a symbol of both Christ, who is fully man and fully God at the same time, but also of us who are covered with the glory of God um, or sanctified by the Holy Spirit within and without. Okay, um, enough, I think, uh, symbolism. The last uh, verse here uh, is a proclamation. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. But what is the day of his wedding? St. Cyril says the, clearly, the day he had his crown, um, just like and the crowning ceremony. What's the day Christ had his crown? On the cross, was the crown of thorns, uh, of all things. And we were ex explained this uh, last time. So the day of his wedding is the day of his passion when he married the church and purchased it with his blood, uh, Saint, uh, as it's mentioned in Acts chapter 20. Finally, Abuna Tadras writes, the church is calling the whole world to enjoy the banquet of the cross. She asked the human race to deny the ego and go forth to rejoice and sing the true king, the new Solomon, crowned by his mother, the Jews, because he was of the Jews, right, with the crown of thorns. <clears throat> so, again, um, the crown of glory here is, is, is not necessarily the crown of his divinity, but he decides to make us his crown. Like St. Paul says to his beloved church, is that he writes to, like the Philippians, you are my joy, you are my crown. So for us to be called the crown by Christ, that's a, that's a great honor. Um, and this not only, so this book not only shows the love that we have for God, but more importantly, uh, the one who loved us first, the love of God for us. Um, <clears throat> glory be to him. Now and ever to the age all ages of men, God willing, we'll continue the study in renewing our love for God, 
um, and having the diligence to rise from our laziness and witness his glory. Next time we'll go into chapter 4, um, which kind of goes back to more of a dialogue of love between the groom and his beloved. Um, just to, to let you know, unfortunately, next time um, uh, we'll not be able to have the sermon live, so try to upload it uh, before Saturday night. Apologize for that, but the following week we'll continue to have it uh, after uh, the Vespers. Let's come to pray. Lord, we just really pray without missing our Father. Lord God's Father, peace is only begotten, Son of Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Peace, gift, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Depart in peace and peace.